let's start again. Let's continue our, our program, or here you are. And it's my great pleasure to invite Professor Dennis Werner, who is a famous anthropologist. He's already, <laughs> for me, he's famous. And uh, he's already retired from the University of Santa Catarina. Uh, he's an anthropologist, right, from the profession. And, but uh, he's actually interested in lots of topics in evolutionary psychology, evolutionary anthropology, in dominance, hierarchies, leadership. And he's actually the author of the first uh, Brazilian book on evolutionary psychology. So it's your turn. Thank you very much, Dennis, that you are here with us. Thank you very much, Jakob. I, I admire Jakob's good humor. I don't know how she can stand that. I can't administer a cleaning lady. I don't know how she can do this. Anyway, um, I changed my talk here at the last minute uh, because of a couple of reasons. First, this is probably the last speech I'll ever give. <laughs> and so I've got to get things out. <laughs> so get them out of my head, whatever. And secondly, because yesterday I had a little chat with someone who was here. Where is he? I don't know if he was here. And he showed me that he was interested in, in a topic we I had talked about. And I said, well, you know, maybe I should talk about that. But I didn't. It wasn't in the original plan. And then Fernando told me, no, oh, what you have to put on the, your slide is this table that you have that influenced a lot of my students. They said that was what changed their thinking. And I've had other people tell me the same thing. Unfortunately, none of them from anthropology. I don't, I don't think anthropologists ever read this thing, even though I wrote it in response to cultural anthropologists. <laughs> but the cultural anthropologists never read it. <clears throat> but I did find that a lot of biologists were interested in, and a lot of neuroscientists. Some of them came up to me and said, oh, well, you've changed. I have to admit, you, you really changed my way of thinking. And so I thought, well, that's interesting if I'm able to do that. Although I've had some people tell me, I can't give this stuff to students because it would destructure all the, their ways of thinking. <laughs> so <laughs> I shouldn't do that. So I'm going to start with it, the thing that they said was so impressive. It, it was published as an article in a book, Darwin, Darwinian Heritage uh, and Sociobiology, a long time ago. And it was published as a book in Portuguese, which is much longer with uh, various chapters, <clears throat> going from ways of thinking reality to simple ways of thinking to animal ways of thinking to human ways of thinking to intellectual ways of thinking to anthropological ways of thinking. And I'm going to show the table that I think was most important. These, I basically think that people underestimate Darwin's influence on the very, very basic way of thinking. And so I'm going to talk a little about the influence of Darwin on this table on the, the most profound, the most basic part of philosophy, which is epistemology and ontology. Epistemology, for those of you who aren't from philosophy, refers to the way, I'm talking about philosophy, I was an undergraduate in philosophy, so that's why, it's, that's why it comes out. <clears throat> it, um, epistemo um, epistemology deals with what we can think, what are we able to think, and ontology deals with what exists. And the way I summarize this relationship is by a little quote from a Cree Indian when once he was asked to swear at a trial uh, about, a, about a dam that was being built on his territory. And basically what he said <clears throat> to, the, to the guy who wanted him to swear to tell the truth and nothing but the truth, he said, how can I swear to tell the truth? I can only say what I know. How can I know if this is the truth? And that's the basic problem about epistemology and ontology. And so I'm starting here with four basic ways of seeing reality. And they actually, they're stages I personally went through. So I, I, I have very personal relationships with these ways of thinking. They're like plateaus you reach at different moments of your life. And of course, I started, as most people do, with as a naive realist, which I call. And a naive realist, I, I use little catchphrases to summarize what, these, what they're about. I put this little quote, a rose is a rose is a rose, basically meaning, stop questioning these stupid things. Of course a rose is a rose. They're facts, they, you know, it's ridiculous to, to, to worry about this stuff. And this, this implies several things about how you think. For example, what do you think of truth? And basically, naive realists say facts are true, but our biases can blind us. But the facts are out there and they're true. 
And in terms of morality, they basically think they're good and there are bad deeds. We can trust lists of sins and professional codes of ethics. In terms of beauty, they would say, ah, oh, some things are naturally pretty or ugly. <laughs> in terms of the good life, they basically follow rules and traditions. That's enough. And in terms of research, they'll basically say, observe well, avoid your biases so you can see the facts as they are. Facts come from natural categories and possess essences. So that's the basic way of naive philosophy. Of course, this was questioned <laughs> by philosophers very early on. Um, I'm going to go on to idealism, which is basically Platonism. It comes, it comes from, was big on the, the early Greeks, Plato and Aristotle and, well, of course, Socrates, who was described by Plato. Um, and this, I took a quote from Ralph Waldo Emerson. This is a quote I got when I was a teenager, I think I was like 15 years old, and we had to read essays by Ralph Waldo Emerson, and he was a Neoplatonist, and very much an idealist, and here's how, what he said of things. He said, particular natural facts are the symbols of particular spiritual facts. Nature is the symbol of spirit. That's a quote from him. This was actually introduced into philosophy in the Western world by Thomas of Aquinas. <laughs> At one point, Thomas Aquinas was a big man, very gentle man normally. He was, he was invited in the Middle Ages to debates all over the place, and he never got angry, except at one point. He once went to a meeting to, to debate on the differences between empirical studies and religion. And people were trying to make these things compatible. And one guy said, well, you know, let's, let's not worry about it. We, the, didn't say scientists, natural philosophers, we'll deal with... <coughs> the way we'll deal with the world, the facts, and you can deal with spiritual things. We'll deal with natural things, and you will deal with spiritual things. Thomas Aquinas was furious. He said, no, spiritual facts and natural facts are the same. You'll get to the same thing. They're absolutely the same. Just, that's exactly what Ralph Waldo, Ralph, Ralph Waldo Emerson is talking about. <clears throat> and that, that is very popular. Idealism is an extraordinarily popular philosophical point of view. I find it very common, especially among natural scientists, mathematicians, um, physicist, others, many like this, this, this system of thought. <clears throat> and as, as in terms of truth, true facts correspond to true ideas or concepts. Those of you familiar with Darwin, you'll remember that at the time of Darwin there was a thing called natural theology by William Paley, and he argued that um, <clears throat> studying nature we will find God, because God is in nature and everything in nature will find God. And Darwin said, wait a minute, that's not, so, that's not so true. Looked at species, Linnaeus was classifying species, there are ideal species, and then there are those species that don't quite reach their potential, they're kind of defective. And museums would put out the ideal species and then leave the others behind or show how they could be defective. And Darwin said, those aren't defectives, those are variations. Evolution depends on these supposed defects. That's ridiculous to think that there are ideal species. They don't exist. <laughs> that was a tremendous change in the way people thought. <clears throat> um, um, let's go on to the idea of goodness. How, did, how do idealists deal with goodness? Well, basically they say, on achieving perfect ideals, um, <clears throat> uh, we achieve exactly what ought to be. At the deepest level, truth, and goodness are the same. This is very Platonic as well. Those of you who read any of Plato will realize how that, uh, if you get down to things, are all, goodness is always there at the end. I just have to find them. <clears throat> um, in terms of beauty, you basically, on achieving ideal perfection, truth, goodness, and beauty are all the same. And the good life is to try to achieve your full potential. This you find in psychology a lot. <laughs> you have to find your potential. That's an idealist point of view. There is an ideal potential for you, and that's what you should try to achieve. That's the aim of an idealist. Um, and how to do research? You basically raise consciousness so you can see the perfect ideals and discover the laws of nature. Well-founded facts and concepts get to the essence of things. This, I, this is a very important point of view. There's a philosopher here, Uspa, who does videos. And I remember seeing her first video. She's a very good teacher, actually. And her first video was about Plato's cave. And I remember watching this, oh, she had a wonderful video. She's showing how philosophers have to question things. They can't go along with everybody else. 
not up to that, I thought was, wow, this woman is a great professor. But then she went into idealism. I realized she's a pure idealist. <laughs> and I say, well, no, that's good. That's, she's found my limits. <clears throat> the third one, the third one is phenomenalism. Phenomenalism is a big thing in anthropology. I spent a lot of time as a phenomenalist. I went, when I went, when I, my last year of high school and all through college when I was studying philosophy and French literature, phenomenalism was everything. Uh, and phenomenalism, my, my quote here is, for life is but a dream and dreams are only dreams. Everything's in your head. Um, <clears throat> And in terms of truth, there are only concepts. Reality is constructed from them. Truths are relatives, are relative. You know, there are alternative truths, alternative facts <laughs> these days. Um, and they're all equal, and you can't separate them out, and that's what alternative facts are. This is very popular in anthropology. It's basically what dominates anthropology these days. <clears throat> in terms of goodness, good and evil are relative. Every group invents its own up school. There, um, where did goodness? Invents its own, every group invents its own moral rules. Um, it's, all, it's all relative. You clearly can't say whether one thing is better than another because it's all in your head anyway. <clears throat> and the way you do research is you, the best you can do, or the way, the good life, you can do a couple of things. You can go into anguish, l'angoisse de uh, Paul Sartre, or you can, you can be, take the life a little easier and just be an epicurus, just enjoy life's pleasure and say, oh, it doesn't matter anyway, so I'll just, I'll just enjoy pleasure and I'll, that's good enough. But they're all basic ideas that, you know, what you're calling realism is all relative, you know, you, it means nothing. And how do you do research? You sit, the best you can do is to seek consensus or at least dialogue so that you can comprehend different concepts which are culturally constructed. This is the famous hermeneutics that people do today, and most cultural anthropologists don't allow you to do anything else. <laughs> so that's a problem. Now, I wrote this book on this, trying to convince anthropologists, no, there is an alternative, and the eternal, alternative is, comes from Darwin. <laughs> and what's, what's the difference between phenomenalism and Darwin and idealism? I put a little quote here from Goethe's Faust. In the beginning was the word, in the scriptures we read, but here I balk. Who will help me now proceed? The spirit helps. For once I'll take its heed and write consoled in the beginning was the deed. <laughs> the beginning, you, should, you notice he's translating the Bible and saying, I don't believe this that in the beginning was the word. The beginning was the deed. It was something that happened. It was concrete. It was, <laughs> which fits much better in evolutionary pattern. You know, the thoughts come after <laughs> um, doing these things. In terms of truth, this is a very important point, our notions of truth and fault, true and false, evolved in order to detect cheating. I'm going to get into this a little bit now. Both people and propositions may be true or false. Propositions are more or less true to the extent that they correspond to data and do not lead to contradictions. So yeah, my way of saying this is, well, you may say truth doesn't exist, but our idea of truth, our way of finding truth, has allowed us to survive and reproduce, and we've done very well by it. <laughs> so I can't be totally divorced from reality. I agree that maybe we don't know what truth is. Maybe what we think is true has nothing to do with what truth is really out there. But it's good enough. That's the way, the, that's the way evolution works. You don't have to be perfect. An example I like to give, I was talking about, is a mother goose who recognizes her chicks by their peeps. And, uh, Conrad Lawrence love to do these kinds of experiments. But if you deafen the, the mother goose and she sees her chicks there, she's apt to kill them. She won't recognize them as her offspring. On the other hand, if you put some baby snakes in her nest and you have a recording of these chick peeps, she'll try to feed the, the baby snakes. Now, that obviously doesn't correspond to the truth about what her, <laughs> what parenthood is, what her offspring is, but it's good enough for evolution. I mean, most mother geese can hear and very rarely will a mother goose find baby snakes peeping in their nests. So we, we, we can see the limits of the goose's thoughts, and we must realize that we humans are the same way. Our notions of truth may not be totally accurate, but they've been pretty good. And they're not like the phenomenalist view that they're only concepts, that reality is just constructed from that. It's got, there's a basis behind that. There's the deed there somewhere, <laughs> and it's worked. <laughs> and that's a very important distinction of Darwin. And I don't think people appreciate just how profound a difference that made 
not only in biology, but in philosophy. It's the very core of philosophy. This is stuff is the very core of philosophy. And Darwin made a huge influence on that, much more than the phenomenalist. You get phenomenalists like Nietzsche, who's one of the first. Um, he basically bought this, this idea. He didn't, he didn't bother with evolution. If he had studied evolution and Darwin profoundly, he would have realized that he was being very arrogant. <laughs> Actually, his last book, H.A. Homer, is extraordinarily arrogant. I'm impressed by <laughs> how self-centered he was. But anyway, <laughs> this, is the, this is the idea of truth. These are constructs, yeah, but they're constructs that have some correspondence to reality. <laughs> Not totally divorced. In terms of goodness, morality, our notions of good and evil evolve together with our capacity for cooperation via reciprocity and dominance hierarchies. I'll be getting into this. What is, what is does not necessarily correspond to what ought to be. Our moral concepts and feelings are not necessarily what they ought to be. We must be careful to avoid the naturalistic, relativistic, and moral fallacies. I um, no, so don't trust. I'll get into this, trust on morality. <clears throat> Um, in terms of beauty, our notions of beauty and ugly evolved. They're not totally arbitrary. They're not in the eye of the, the, eye of the, the perceiver. Um, our notions evolved po possibly as adaptations for seeking good sexual partners or safe productive environments or nutritious food, whatever. But they're not totally arbitrary. <laughs> they have some base in evolution. Um, in terms of good life, what can we do? I basically say, let's try to adjust our personal desires to social and practical needs. And we may talk a little bit about this later, too. Um, you know, just adjust yourself. You're not going to be perfect. You, you can live with this, whatever. <clears throat> and how to do research? Basically, we have to use and control biases. But data derived from categories constructed by the researchers, but they use concepts or perceptions that are universal among humans so others can replicate data. The eye of science is that we can replicate things that we can replicate studies. That's the really thing you could say, this was well shown. <laughs> so anyway, these are the things I want to talk about first because some people said, well, this, I've had several people tell me, well, that really influenced the way I think. Just remember, looking at how Darwin influenced the very core of philosophy. And I think that's really underappreciated by evolutionists. Very underappreciated. Um, <laughs> so I just wanted to get that point out there because it's my last speech anyway. So anyway. <laughs> Um, now let's talk about the, the topic of this thing, which is the evolution of dominance hierarchies. Implications for politics, violence, sexuality, and religion. That's too much talk. I'm going to have to cut some of that. Um, what are the aims? The, the first aim of this talk is to show the importance of personal dominance hierarchies. I, personal dominance hierarchies, in my view, are the basic basis of the evolution of cooperation. Most people when they, evolution, when they talk about cooperation, are talking about how our selfish genes made us personally so altruistic that we can sacrifice our lives because of those selfish genes. <laughs> or, the alternative, it's reciprocity. People cooperate in order to increase the well-being of both. The problem with the reciprocity studies is they almost always assume equal partners in the reciprocity. That's almost never the case. Certainly not the case in animals. <laughs> So what's happened to the dominant side? Because they're central to our base for the origins of cooperation. And so I want to talk about just how central dominant hierarchies are to a lot of things. That's why I talk. That's why I mentioned politics, violence, sex, religion, and so forth. <clears throat> I, I hope I can convince people to start thinking about dominant hierarchies a little more. The other thing I want to do, since this is my last speech, is to ins maybe hope maybe inspire someone to think of something they never thought of before, or maybe think of something they had thought of before, but not in this way. Now, I would be very pleased if that happens. <laughs> you, even if one or two of you come up with something, that's enough. I'm not very demanding. The other, thing, so, the other thing I'm going to do, I'm not doing empirical research. I'm not doing field work or anything like that anymore, and I don't have students to, make, to, <laughs> to do that for me. So I'm going to throw out lots of ideas for research. They're going to be in red in this presentation. I'm not going to talk about all of them. They're on my home page at Blogspot I put there for you. Or you can find them at ResearchGate. So if you're interested in something like that, it's good to have lots of ideas. Bad ideas are great because, as I mentioned before, we have to contrast ideas in research. Let's look at alternative explanations. And if you want an alternative explanation to put down, I, I'm providing a lot of them. You can just 
pulled out one of them and says, well, Dennis Werner said this at a conference. <laughs> so it's, it's a stupid idea, I agree, but someone has believed in it, so let's, <laughs> so let's look at it. And I think it's, it might be useful to, for some of you to look at some of that. It might be good for a couple of senior theses or whatever. <laughs> um, so I'm, I'm, doing a, I'm throwing out a lot of research. I won't be talking about it all, but it's there on the, on the page. So if somebody wants to scour through that and pull out some theories to put down, they're there. <clears throat> So those are the two things I want to get out of the, the two things that I want to get out of this talk. <clears throat> I want to begin the talk with the uh, uh, moral system. Oh, I, I missed a file. A, a file didn't show up there. Hi. Oh, unfortunately, I don't know why this didn't show up. Um, I had a quote here, but I want, I'm going to talk about morality. I go now. My quote was from Isaac Asimov. He said, this is, the, this is the point of this section of the research, he said, never let your morals get in the way of doing what's right. <laughs> I think that's a very important point. He's basically saying, don't trust your moral feelings and don't trust your moral reasoning. <laughs> They're going to get you into trouble. And I'm going to try to show why that's so. It's unlike Socrates, I, or as described by Plato, I would say, no, there's no. You're not going to look deep and find goodness in human nature. We've actually talked about some of that yesterday. I mean, um, actually, it's in t in interesting that in, in Western philosophy, we have Plato and the crowd, the Neoplatonic part, preaching ultimate goodness in human nature. But on the other hand, Christianity pre preaches original sin. So we are, by nature, sinful and unclean, which we always had to say in church <laughs> at the time. So they're two opposite views. I think they're both a little exaggerated. But... Um, Anyway, you can see they're, they're contrasting views. <clears throat> so never, never let your morals get in the way of doing what's right. That's the point here. <clears throat> and the first question is the question of the confusion between is and ought. This was the topic of my first day in catechism. Being cate I was 12 years old, being catechized into the Lutheran Church. And our, professor, and our catechism professor was a philosophy professor from the local Lutheran College. And you might find it a little unusual, but the theme of our first day was the difference between is and ought and what to do to connect them or not connect them or what can you do. <laughs> and I always surprised that other people hadn't had this first lesson in catechism. <laughs> and, and so I started thinking, I have to tell my colleagues about this. They have to know about this. And here there's some confusion about, first, about where this confusion comes from. Just note our vocabulary, how we confuse these concepts. First, right and wrong, those terms. Right can be something, you know, you answer your question right on a multiple choice test. Or it was wrong. That's a question of what is. <laughs> or you can say, you're acting badly. You're, 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 you're right to do that. That's a question of what ought to be, what you ought to do. Those are, but we use the same term. We also talk about true and false. A, a fact can be true, something we said. Uh, uh, Denmark is a country in Europe. That's a true fact, basically. But my wife is true. That means someone I can count on, she's morally upright, whatever, or she's false. She's someone <laughs> who I can't trust. <laughs> it's, it's a moral question. It's about what ought to be. Third, um, we have A, something in causality. A is responsible for B. That could mean several things. That could mean A causes B. That's a question of what is. <clears throat> or it could mean A is guilty for B. You know, <laughs> you're responsible for our child's bad behavior. That's an odd question. <laughs> but um, um, they, they putting oxygen and hydrogen together causes explosions. That's a question of is. <laughs> so we cruise it. And the last one that didn't show up here is the word laws. We talk about physical laws in physics. That's a question of is, what is. And then we talk about laws that legislators pass. That's a question of ought. So you can see just our vocabulary already confuses these things tremendously. So, why, so where, where does this confusion come from? As you might expect, it comes from our evolutionary past. <clears throat> and here's the evolutionary origins of, of this confusion. Our notion of truth evolved from our capacity to de detect whether others are being honest, true, or false, dishonest. And so I put a little example of tactical a deception here. Here we've got a monkey. Kind of looks like a baboon. I don't know what it is. But he's thinking, he's trying to deceive the alpha male here. The alpha male looks a little suspicious. But what this one is thinking is that, ah, oh, the alpha male, all he can see 
is me and this rock. He doesn't know I'm humping one of his females. <clears throat> um, of course, this capacity to recognize what the other thinks is kind of complicated in terms of our thinking. And of course, this creates an arms race because this guy is going to have to be able to detect that the, the other one's being un false. And he'll do that by saying, well, the rock, he may be trying to deceive me, but his, motion, his motions give him away. He's doing motions that don't, don't make sense. <laughs> and you find he contradicted himself. There's the contradiction. You know, contradiction is also a logical concept. <laughs> but there's a contradiction in his behavior. Well, this kind of um, deceptive behavior <clears throat> What? Okay, this, this kind of deceptive behavior, many people think is so important that it's the reason the human brain evolved. Um, Volker Zummer, some of you may know him as a famous primatologist, he wrote a book especially on this, Lope der Lüge, in, in praise of lying, arguing that you know, lies are, were so important, our ability to lie and our ability to detect lies. It created an arms race, each one, everyone <laughs> required to get better and better at this. <clears throat> it's so important that you can actually show this statistically. This is a comparison of different primate species. Um, and you can see it's tact the, the ability of the species to practice tactical deception versus the neocortex ratio of these primates, the ratio of their neocortex to the rest of the brain. And you can see a pretty good line here that the the more t they're able to do tactical deception, the larger their brains. Actually, I pick a fight with Richard Dawkins because it's an ancestral tale. He attributes brain growth to a totally arbitrary sexual selection, and he ignored this data, and he knew about it. I thought that was being dishonest on his part. <laughs> he must be an enemy of Richard Byrne. That's, that's the only explanation I can give for it. <laughs> uh, all right, now there's some traditional fallacies and philosophies that result from this confusion between is and ought. This is the stuff I got in Sunday school. <laughs> um, first, there's naturalistic fallacy. It comes in two versions. First version says that anything that is natural is good, and anything artificial is bad. Um, I confess I always found that very difficult to swallow. My father's a veterinarian. I said some pretty awful things <laughs> in nature and other things. And I said, I can't believe that nature is good in itself and artificial things are bad. That didn't, I couldn't swallow that. Um, some people actually do buy that idea. Nietzsche basically said that. The Marquis of Sade thought that way. Um, Georges Bataille wrote a book, La Part Maudite, on that, in which he praised the Hindu god Shiva, the god of destruction. And I'm sure a lot of dictators and conquerors, and I bet Genghis Khan thought this was, it's basically a might makes right idea of, <laughs> of morality, basically. If nature's evil, we should be evil too. <laughs> if nature's cruel, we need to be cruel too. Um, it's kind of a scary thought, but I think it's still around. That dictators think you have to be, it's force that determines what's good. <laughs> There's another version of the naturalistic fallacy, which we talked about a little bit already, that human nature is basically good, and unnatural behaviors are bad. Well, I'm going to try to show that human nature is not particularly good. <laughs> we actually had some evidence from that yesterday among the Akka. <clears throat> There's a second fallacy called the relativistic fallacy. This is the idea that if a culture thinks something is good, then we have to accept it as good. I can't swallow that either. I mean, some cultures have some pretty nasty stuff. They do human sacrifices and, and they kill people because they're wearing their own clothes and um, all kinds of stuff. I can't buy that. I, I'm sorry. That, <laughs> that just doesn't go with me. And I think the thing that everyone in a culture agrees with the cultural norms. No. I can't swallow that. <clears throat> and finally, and all third, there's the moralistic fallacy. The moralistic fallacy goes the other way around. It says that if something ought to be, then it is. Men and women ought to be equal, therefore they are equal. Or the value of a good or service ought to come from the work invested in it. Or, <clears throat> um, and therefore it does. The value of, an, of a service or good does result from the work invested in it, and if there's a difference in the price, it's because someone's stealing the, the surplus value. <laughs> those, are, those are questions of moralistic fallacy, going the other way around, and they're pretty common today too. 
in academia. Finally, vision of moral nihilism. Moralism, there's no such thing as morality. Forget it all, there's nothing. I think that's an untenable position because humans die without this if they don't have a, an idea of what's good or what's better. Um, Anthony, Antonio Damasio had a patient once who had a brain damage and he couldn't decide what was better and what was worse. He couldn't do the basic work. He couldn't file because he couldn't decide what system, what, how he, what would be the better way to file a document. He was totally lost. He, had, he was under total care. You have, we need preferences, <laughs> otherwise we die. <laughs> and if we need preferences, we're defining already what is good and what isn't, or what we think is better and what is not. So I think this is un untenable. <clears throat> well then, there's, oh uh, yeah, that's, oh, I just came up the wrong place. Um, so what do we do? Here, here are some traditional ways people think of morality. These are basically the basis of moral arguments um, at different ages, so it's ontogeny, young babies basically decide that what's good is what feels good, and what's bad is what feels bad, what's not, what gives nausea. It's a very direct kind of thing. It's good if, I, if I'm feeling good or not. When you get a little older, children will start to think that obedience is good. That's because obedience is going to affect what feels good or what doesn't feel good, because your parents are apt to hit you, and you realize that, and you start to obey them or whatever. Um, in, in, in teenage years, when your group, social group gets a little larger, your social group is everything. I mean, you, you, you want to please your social group, and loyalty is the big thing. That comes in, that's how you decide what something is good or not. So good is loyal, and bad is disloyalty or treason. <laughs> and only, not everybody reaches the final stage, but it's, it, it'll, it'll come later. Principles, you start basing your morality on principles. I mentioned earlier the Lutheran idea of open morality. You have a basic principle, which we got as love God and do as you please. That was supposedly a Martin Luther statement. I don't know if it's true. But it's the idea that you have a, a principle behind that. Um, and then, then you base moral decisions on that principle. The principles most likely used by people are justice and care. Today, liberty seems to be a big theme. You know, you need freedom, freedom of religion, freedom to bear arms, freedom to do... That's become a big thing. That wasn't in the past. In terms of men and women, men seem to prefer the justice criteria, and women prefer the caring, the caring criteria. criteria for that. But I I'm going to prefer the caring, the caring type of... The caring bit says that um, the law above all laws, I'm going to get to that, is... Um, love God and do it, but I would say is the law above all is maximized, this is my phrase, maximized in a sustainable way, physical and mental well-being. There's some problems with that, but I'll get to that. <clears throat> but one thing that I think is, you find from this stuff is something that comes from Kant. Kant was very much an, a philosophical idealist, and he basically thought everybody knew the difference between right and wrong. And so if there's a child who was really brought up very badly, is beaten, and starving and he starts committing crimes, you can still punish the child because the child knows in his inner self what is right and wrong. We seem to have adopted that idea that people instinctively know what is right and wrong. That, that, I mean, this is found in our insanity plea. The idea is that only insane don't know what's right or wrong. And that's, I think that's a crazy system, but that's what people believe and it comes from Kant. And uh, so that's just one big problem with this idealist viewpoint. <clears throat> oh, I didn't mention the evolution of moral thinking is by group size. This is also a phylogeny thing. Animals, pretty solitary, basically follow this rule, feels good. That's it. Animals are a little more social. We have an alpha male, for example. Then it's obedience to the alpha that's going to be good because it's going to affect that. And when you have coalitions among animals, then you start getting loyalty being important. And I think only humans, apart for, with a huge group, including all of humanity or whatever, you get into the, the bigger principles. <clears throat> to, to tie moral indignation with dominance hierarchies, I would just point out one thing. First, I'd point out that moral indignation is really a type of group threat. It says if it were a single threat, a single male, he'd say, you do this, you're, you're bad, I'm going to beat you. <clears throat> so watch yourself. Moral indignation is a type of group threat. It says, I'm not going to beat you, but there's a whole group behind me, and they're going to 
this coalition is going to hit you. That's moral indignation. And the problem with moral indignation, it's not necessarily good. That's the problem with coalitions in general. I mean, you can be morally indignant, and this often happens, for, with awful reasons. I mean, you have the idea of uppity blacks. A lot of Southerners complain about uppity blacks. Um, they don't know their place. In, the English upper class often claim that people are acting beyond their station. I remember once seeing a, an Episcopalian hymn with the words, God gave every place his station in life, and you should accept that. And they get really indignant if someone tries to act above their station. <laughs> now, these are forms of indignation. They're basically threats, um, threats to, to someone who's not following what they think they ought to be, what, what ought to be the case. <clears throat> um, now, go, going back to this principle, there are some problems with it, and I recognize that. And I've, I, these are some of the things I've suggested. I'm not going to go into the research suggestions. If you want to call some of these out to knock down, they're on the page. You can find them and use them. And they're experiments for social psychologists, based on priming. And a couple of things for philosophers to, to show the limits of my principle there. First of all, who should be included, included when you say increase well, physical and mental well-being. I mean, what animals get included there? To feed it, how long do fetuses get included? Whatever. Kant thought, well, it's important to use. Pain is a big thing and criterion. And Rachel thought that, ah, if you can project life into the future, that's a big, that's a big factor. Decide how, how much an animal or whatever is worthy of uh, well-being, whatever. The other thing with this is how do you deal with inequalities? Not inequalities in wealth so much, but inequalities in well-being, in physical and mental well-being. John Rawls made a suggestion about a sort of um, lottery. Imagine when you're being born, you have different systems, you have to decide um, how much inequality you're going to accept in terms of well-being, and you don't know where you're going to end up in life. <laughs> and how willing are you to risk being at the bottom um, to, to accept that that much inequality is enough? That, that's John Rawls' answer to inequalities. <clears throat> and then there's a third one. I don't know if any philosophers ever talked about it. What do you do with incomplete knowledge? How do you know if something brings well-being or not? I mean, that's, that's, a, that's a big problem. That's a problem with the trolley car experiment that um, our psychiatrist friend was talking about yesterday. <laughs> so, so these are a couple of problems with philosophers. They're, they're research problems. I was going to talk about them, but I didn't mention that. Ah, these slides aren't coming out. I don't know why. The next topic is, was on, I'm going to go back on the top politics, the first talk. I'm not going to talk a whole lot about them, but I just wanted to mention there's obvious relationships between our political systems and dominance hierarchies among animals. Of course, the most obvious ones are postures. Here's a chimpanzee, angry, trying to make himself look big, ready to attack someone else. And here's George W. Bush, arms out, making himself look good, looking ahead, not worried about the others. Here's Vice President Cheney showing himself subordinate to George W. Bush, his arms safely in front of him, his head down. And here's his father, ex-president George H. Bush, sort of in between. And we basically follow the primate physical <laughs> expressions of dominance. And here's a couple of other examples. Here's a dominant male showing his teeth ready to bite. And here's a submissive showing his teeth closed, not likely to bite at all, <laughs> showing the other one is not going to bite. Here are humans. A dominant posture, and here's this fellow with, um, in my youth, we used to call that a shit eating grin. Um, <laughs> um, so he's on my elbow, I should see stuff all in Portuguese. This is just a little discussion of what, what leadership traits do people have. The first two columns are from my peer, peer ratings and other things among the Mekonerti Indians that I did in 1966 and 67. And here are a column of studies from the United States from a handbook in leadership summarizing hundreds of studies on leadership traits. And I just wanted to show some, a few things to notice. Um, first of all, notice that men's and women's hierarchies are very different among the micro I couldn't put them together. I asked people, simply, I just asked them a general question. Who do you follow? Who, who's a, who, whose speech do you follow? And they started naming, all of my informants started naming men. And they would just go on naming and naming and naming before turning to women. And I realized I had to separate them out. They forced me to separate men's hierarchies from women's hierarchies. I was, I, so I, there are two separate hierarchies going on here. And they're basically independent. 
Whereas in the United States, well, our hierarchies are combined. Here in this room, we have men and women in the same hierarchy. <laughs> It's a very different kind of way of thinking about male and female status. <clears throat> First of all, in, in terms of what happens with these, you notice in both things, the crude primate stuff comes out, height, size, and aggressiveness are there. That's true, but they're not the only things. I would just point out a couple of differences between the Mecca and Erti, basically an egalitarian society in southern Pará. Intelligence was a pretty important predictor of influence among them. You notice in the United States, these are rankings. The United States, they ranked pretty low. Intelligence wasn't a very big thing. I think this is because intelligent people in our society talk to other intelligent people. They're, they're scientists talking to other scientists. They're, people are intelligent, too intelligent, can't communicate with people. <laughs> Whereas in the macro energy, they had no choice. They had to talk to everybody else. And the other thing I want to point out is grid geographical centrality. It's pretty unimportant among the macro energy. This was simply a question of who lives closer to the center, who's seen more often in the village. It was pretty low on the things that predict leadership. Whereas in the United States, it was much higher. It's a, it's like third rank. Um, and of course, we see this all the time. Celebrities get elected. Ronald Reagan was an actor, and Arnold Schwarzenegger was an actor, and Donald Trump was a TV host. Um, geographic visibility is very important in our society, not in others. <clears throat> um, all right, now I'm gonna, from here on in, I'm gonna be talking about <clears throat> data that I picked up for this study. Ah, my pictures aren't coming out in this, this um, major pictures aren't coming out in this special, I don't know why. Damn. Oh, I don't like this. What's here? I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I wanted to show a picture of what a cross-cultural correlation looks like. Maybe I'll find one. Maybe I'll be able to get one. What's happening here? Can you click on this one? Okay, here's, a, here's, a, here's what a cross-culture correlation looks like. I don't know why these pictures weren't showing. Ah, I disappeared again. <laughs> Here, here's a... <laughs> I'm, I'm not so worried about what, what the correlation is about. I just want you to know what it looks like. So when I talk about a cross-cultural correlation, I'm talking about tables like this. Here, I'm, we're gonna talk about this table later, but here you basically you have internal warfare very little internal warfare, and a lot of more internal warfare in the right column. In the rows, you have a homosexual system when you have only a gender stratified system, which means that normal, ordinary males have sex with a culturally designated different male, a Bisha Buffy kind of thing. Um, <clears throat> and down here, you have cultures where men typically it's expected that men will engage in homosexual behavior. And you can see a correlation. These are the names of societies that have followed these states. Here's in the upper left-hand corner. You have the Alleries, just to name some, the Grotto Ventre, Casca, Sirio Noeli, some South American ones, Wolof, Zuni. And here, you notice that they cluster up in the upper left corner. You get a lot of societies up here. And you get a lot of societies down here which basically means these are societies where you have internal war, but you also have homosexuality expected of most men. So you have, there are a couple of societies you will recognize, the Zandi maybe, you probably recognize the Yanomami, Tupinambar there, um, a few others. Um, and this basically shows that there's a correlation here. You have internal warfare, we have a lot of internal warfare, you have ordinary men having sex with ordinary men. <laughs> And where you don't have that, you don't have ordinary men having sex with ordinary men. So, <laughs> so that, that's, how, that's what a correlation means. At this point, I just want you to understand that. <clears throat> um, so every time I talk about a cross-cultural correlation, I'm talking about tables that look like this. I'm not going to show the tables. I'm just going to point out the, the data. Ah, so it wasn't in the original. What is this? Ay, ay, ay. I'm 
I'm way up. I should be way up here. I need to get me up. Get me further up. Get me up to the. Get me further, much further up. No, no, not on here. No, way up. No, up. Put, put me up. Up, further up. Further up, a little bit. Further, further up. Oh, here. Get me. What is? When is going to be bullied? Uh, just a, some cross quotes. When do leaders bully? That's a big problem these days. When do get try? What societies create tyrants? So this is your cross cultural correlations. These numbers here are numbers from the Ethnographic Atlas. If you don't know what the Ethnographic Atlas is, it's a data bank. You can access it on the internet if you want to check all my data. These are pre-codes -co pre that are that ethnographers have gone through the literature on different societies, and they've coded them for different variables. And these are the variable numbers that are in the standard cross-cultural sample. So you can check me if you want to audit my results. Um, so uh, you found that despotic leaders are, these are basically definitions of things, they basically imply no checks on a leader's power, leaders are removed only through rebellion, leaders make independent authoritative decisions. That sort of ex these variables basically describe what we mean by despotic leadership. And what, what's Close, what's most closely associated with that? It's war. War is endemic. There's a lot of inter-community warfare. External warfare is frequent. There are military organizations like age grades. Warfare decisions are taken by officials. Warfare begins by announcement. High casualty rates in war. War leaders can use force to back up decisions, and warfare is valued and enjoyed. Well, I don't know if that has much implications for threats of tyrancy today, but I, basically what's happening here is pretty clear that um, people are scared and they want quick action <laughs> to protect themselves. And so they're willing to put up with the tyrant as long as you can get rid of the danger. And I think that's what's happening here. <laughs> um, <clears throat> but there's also a thing called bullying by groups. It's not an individual tyrant, but a group can bully. And here are some recent studies. I called them defense for conformity versus um, more open societies. Actually, in the literature these days, they're called tight and close and close societies. I don't like that terminology. I think they're basically societies that demand conformity. Um, these are some things that kind of define it. it. It's based on, it's related to more prejudice toward ethnic, religious, and sexual minorities and greater punishments for nonconformists. These are basically defining features. These correlations have been found cross nations, you compare different nations, you get a correlation. You compare different states within the United States, you get that same correlation. And you use the ethnographic atlas and you correlate, look for correlations among cultures, you get the same thing. I think it's rather incredible that three very different types of comparisons have come to the same conclusions. And what's, what's related to this? What causes this demand for conformity? The big thing seems to be warfare, so ecological threats, warfare, disease, outbreaks, and resource scarities. Scarcity. What's going on here? Um, I think we need to think what? Here's some possibilities. I, this hasn't been tested, so here's something somebody might want to look at. Are these threat, do these threats cause fear of trying anything new? If I step out of line, I might get killed. <laughs> I might die. Or are they cause, do they cause mistrust of others and so require demonstrations of loyalty? Do they cause need for cooperation um, to require common views? Or oh, there's an opposite trend. Maybe you don't want conformity if you're into innovation. Then you want people, you want to mix people together. So those are, those are things to look at, questions about what makes people, what makes a group demand conformity? Why did the Taliban, why are they so insistent on conformity? And that, it pretty much fits these things here. They're, they're, they don't have innovative industries. Um, you might even find within different industries, for example, the diamond trade, that's a, that demands a lot of trust. You transform, you're transmitting a lot of very expensive things in your pocket or whatever. And basically it's run by Orthodox Jews in Antwerp and New York or whatever. And they, they can trust each other. They're a very close knitting group. They demand conformity, clothes and meat and food and everything else. You've got to trust them. Cars trust. <clears throat> uh, some research questions that someone might be interested in. You look them up if you want to later. <clears throat> that was basically the only thing I'm going to talk about with the leadership. Sexuality. I want to talk about partnership, partner choice, rape, and homosexuality. I'm going to go rapidly over these. Women's professions, I don't think there's anything that surprises anybody here. 
related to dominance. Um, I don't even know if I need to read these. These are so well known that women find physically dominant men more interesting for short term, but they prefer less dominant men for long term mating. Women for social, so socially dominant, high prestige men over physically dominant men. Women who fear crime are more likely to desire physically dominant males. Women prefer submissive roles in BDSM. Women are more dominant men. Women find more dominant men attractive, but not more dominant women. Men are more interested in women's looks and age than prestige. Men prefer a dominant role in BDSM. Men find more dominant men attractive, but not more dominant women. In healthier societies, it's a curious one, men think more feminine faces are pretty. What's going on here? Here's a, a graph, a cross-country graph. You find that in countries where you have the, the healthier countries, people want pretty women. <laughs> and in less healthy countries, they're not so interested in being women being so pretty. I think they've got more practical concerns going on there. And these are the data here. Czech Republic is up here. Huh. <laughs> Comment that. <laughs> um, I, I, one of the questions, Carol Ember found this, and this is a cross-cultural study, like the ones I was doing. Um, you can find here that there's a slight tendency for, um, we have a marked emphasis on, um, <clears throat> men, high value of men being aggressive, you find that they prefer plump women. They have to be, oh, the Yiddish word would be zaftig, you have to slightly shenyus. <laughs> and where um, they have a moderate emphasis or no emphasis, then you're more likely to want slimmer women. I think this has to do with fertility. I just looked at a couple of things, too little data to really draw much conclusion, but um, when, they want one, when they want fewer children, they tend to prefer younger, yeah, slimmer women. When they want more children, they want fat women, fatter women. That's because very slim women have trouble getting pregnant. <laughs> I remember when I was looking at the, one of the questions I asked in my country is, who's good looking? And the women surprised me because I would, I would ask, and they all named as the prettiest woman in the village, this woman that I thought was tremendously fat. <laughs> and I always remember her surrounded by these children in the front of her hut. She had a pretty face, I admit, but huge. And the woman that all the Westerners thought was pretty, slim, and was, no, she's not interesting at all. She looks like a boy. <laughs> so that sort of fits this scheme. Um, now rape. Rape, I'm going to do something I asked everyone to do. It's contrast different arguments. So I'm going to give four, four, a couple of different arguments. I think there are three different arguments or four. Um, why some societies have more rape than others. The first argument is that men rape because they lack access to women. And let's see what, that, what happens here. Frequency of rape is not correlated with, it doesn't fit with ratio of men to women, doesn't correlate with a later, later age of marriage for males, it doesn't predict the, freak, the percentage of men who are married polygynously. So that rape doesn't have much to do with that. But rape is more common where you have a higher percentage of women married polygynously. This is possible because there are, all, there are societies with very skewed sex ratios because of male mortality and warfare. And there are societies where old men marry young women and the younger men remain without women. They just, a lot of men are hoarding a lot of the women. Um, but, <clears throat> but it's a few men doing this. And the second argument, so this, is, this has a mild argument in favor, but I don't think it's really a lack of, um, lack of women, I'm going to say, this is the only thing that might be considered supportive of that argument. The second argument is that men rape more where patriarchy, male social dominance is stronger. But the frequency of rape is not correlated with most measures of women's power in society or with the, power, the value placed on women's lives. But it is more common where males do virtually no domestic work, where males have total say over their own work, where women contribute little to subsistence. I think something is going on here. This is societies with you have very different lives and to, between men and women. Remember the Mekonti I was saying, you know, they, the hierarchies are very different, as if they're different species that live in different worlds. And I think this re reflects that male hierarchies are pretty important because you could, the men are living with other men most of the time, and there's male hierarchies, this personal hierarchies come into play. So I think that's probably important here. Another argument is men rape more where there's more warfare and aggressiveness in general. And frequency 
is not associated with any of the, vari the variables related to war, but it is more common where males are tougher. Males are tougher. Tougher males are males where men um, are valued, or they, they value um, being aggressive, strong, and sexually potent, imbrachavio in Brazilian's terms. <laughs> that those, like, and rape is more common where males are tougher. <laughs> <clears throat> the argument for rape is more common where women lack the protection of family. But it's not correlated with natural locality or uxoral locality where women um, are, live near their relatives. So that doesn't very well explain rape. <laughs> I mean, they get raped with or without relatives nearby. And it's not related to endogamy. Endogamy is where you marry people within your own village. And so you have relatives nearby. <laughs> so that I would throw out that argument, and we le we're left with um, males being tough, and hi. And um, the separation of men and females' um, lives. Oh, I should point something out that some people confuse. A lot of people worried about gender-neutral languages. <laughs> Kayapo is a uh, gender-neutral language. There are no nouns neither nines nor pronouns have sex. You don't, there's no he, she, or it. There are no a ah, <laughs> mulher or a ah, ah, cadeira, none of that. It's just cadeira, there's no sex. Some of the most sex, gender, the most gender neutral language on earth are not at all women's um, um, places where women have a lot of power. For example, one of the most gender neutral languages on earth is Urdu, which is spoken in Pakistan. Oh, Chinese is pretty um, gender neutral as well. It doesn't even have gender pronouns, as if you know Mandarin. <clears throat> anyway. Oh, I'm going back. <clears throat> Next question I'm going to talk a lot more about. These are some of my studies. About male homosexuality. What's behind male homosexuality in evolution? How can you explain male homosexuality? And there are basically three arguments from evolutionary psychology. The first argument says, the same gene that gives rise to homosexuality also makes homosexuals' female relatives more fecund. Fecund in, Eng in English means fertile, and fertile in Portuguese. So they switch those terms around. In, in English, fertile means fecundo in Portuguese. That, that's, it's really complicated. <laughs> so, you know, but it, there's evidence for that. Yeah, there's some data on that. <laughs> The second argument is that the genes that give rise to exclusive homosexuality, we're mostly worried about exclusive homosexuality, general homosexuality, no one's worried about that, having selection problems too much. But it's more likely, it's likely to have males are more likely to give help to their relatives. That's the second argument. And there's some argument, male homosexuals tend to help, to help their relatives. That's, that's true. Their nieces and nephews. <clears throat> the third one is my argument. <laughs> it's basically that the genes that give rise to exclusive homosexuality make their male and female relatives more cooperative with each other because they show a willingness to yield in disputes. They're more submissive. This is going back to the hierarchy arguments, um, which in, which in disputes which give the kin group an advantage in raising children. That is, if you have a group of people who are willing to cooperate, who are willing to give in to others, they're willing to submit, that's all fine. If they don't, if you have a group that's very aggressive, they're going to kill each other. So they're not even going to get near reproduction. They're going to die before they reproduce. You might think, well, on the other hand, an exclusive homosexual isn't going to reproduce, but his relatives are. Um, so you have to have a mixture. The, the two extremes aren't going to reproduce. Either being too aggressive, too dominant, or too submissive, you won't reproduce. But you need to have those mixture every generation. So every generation, you're going to get some extremes on, and the, the two extremes. And so that, that, that explains that argument. <clears throat> I don't know why this thing got out of sync. I think I'm, I'm disturbed by this. Oh, there are a couple things. Um, no, it's Why is this coming up blank? Okay. 
No, is there? Ah, oh, damn, I've got, I've got lost again. I don't know what's Some of these slides are coming up blank. They, yeah. Well, the basic thing I want to get into, how well do these, these, all three explanations are okay with adaption. They all have a reason why homosexual genes might get passed on through your relatives, kin selection there. But there's a difference in the way, I have to go back, way back, that's, oops. I don't know. what's this, I can't see. No, way much, much, much further back. No, down, down. The cross but the, an evolutionary explanation. Go down, go down. The next one after this. No, ah, forget it. Well, I must. I don't know what happened to the, the other slide. There was a slide showing that there's a problem with <coughs> phylogeny explanations. It's not enough to say that something is adaptive. You have to say where did it come from. I mean, you can't just create adapt adaptation out of nothing. So you have to look at the primate. How did this evolve from something in primates? And the first thing that says that female, the female relatives of homosexuals are more fertile, I don't have any evidence from that from primates or why that should be so. It's a bizarre, in terms of phylogeny, I can't figure it out. The second explanation is, oh, well, they help their relatives. Well, the only primates that I know where non-reproducing relatives help, uh, primates help their reproducing relatives are the saguis and marmosets, I mean, they, <laughs> But they're not, they don't, there's no homosexuality involved. They're pretty distant from humans. So I don't, and they don't practice homosexuality anyway. So I don't think that doesn't, doesn't go very far. But the third argument that talks about <coughs> um, <coughs> hierarchies, I think there's an explanation there. How did cooperation, human cooperation begin? Start with solitary animals. What's the first form of communication with other animals? They mark their territories. <laughs> That's communication, but there's the solitary animals. Evolution changes bit by bit. The second stage is maybe a dominant male thinks, well, it might be convenient to have another male, let another male into my territory. After all, maybe a predator will attack him rather than me, at the very least. Um, so it might be an advantageous to let someone into my territory. But there's a condition. He has to recognize that I'm, this is my territory. And how does he do it? The same things he used to mark territory is now gonna mark the submissive male. <laughs> So you're going to have, and they're, you're going to make the submissive male pay homage. He's going to have to kiss ass. He's going to have to, um, you can piss on, piss him off if you want. You can, um, uh, actually there's a primate that is a pushasako. I forget what the one is, they want to literally <laughs> pushasako. <laughs> the other, um, the subordinate does those kinds of things to show homage to the alpha male, to make, to make it clear that he's accepting his role as a submissive within this group. When there's a little more cooperation, it may be convenient for the alpha male, the top male, to say, well, I don't want you to leave, so I'll give in every now and then. So we'll cooperate a little bit, and we'll, tro we'll change roles. We'll switch roles every now and then. And that, of course, that's just an expansion of what happens with baby or young, young primates. I mean, they play adult activities, so they're going to play with dominance and submissive behaviors and may change them. And if this continues into old age, oh, yeah, okay. if this continues into, <laughs> into old age, then you've got homosexuals. I am way behind. <clears throat> um, the, other, the other thing that I think is important is that the, this homosexual argument works much better for the cross-cultural studies. And the basic argument is homosexuality has to do with cooperation. Where do you need the most cooperation among males is where you have internal warfare. Internal warfare means you're fighting with people who speak the same language. How do you guarantee their loyalty? You have to have something a little more than just the language. And that's where you get this famous system called the master-apprentice relationships. This is common in a lot of cultures, a lot more than people think. Where you're an older, the Greeks are the best known, an, an older male will take on a younger male as um, an apprentice, and there'll be sexual relations involved, and then the younger male will graduate into an older male, and he'll have sex with a younger male. And they're, they're called boy wives among the Azandi in Sudan. This situation is common all over the world. You might think it's pretty rare. New Guinea is full of societies that would have this system, and they're extraordinarily similar. <laughs> uh, that's why I think, you know, I'm not taking things so far out of context. It's just the, the, the story. They're too similar to be chance. In the New World, I know that at least the Maya have this system and a few others. Um, <clears throat> so it's a fairly common system. And it's most common 
so I just wanted to, so in cross-culture terms, I'm looking at societies with, where non-differentiated males, heterosexuals, have sex with other non-differentiated males. There are several reasons. There's war and prison rapes, the story of Sodom and Gomorrah. It's also very common in modern warfare. I saw recently that in Congo, they're complaining about male rape for the enemies. Um, the comment about <coughs> male rape is very common in Bosnia, even today, it's in the Congo. It's, 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 it's fairly common in war. It's not publicized too much, but it happens a lot. It's a way to humiliate your enemy. There are systems with catamites where you have young boys kept as sexual partners for wealthy sultans or whatever. And then you have war buddies like Achilles and Patroclus or Jonathan and David in the Bible, or the very first literature, Gilgamesh, the myth of Gilgamesh, which had sex with Enkidu, and they formed an alliance. The second system I want to distinguish in is, is when non-differentiated males, ordinary males, have sex with culturally distinguished homosexuals. Bisha Bafi in Portuguese. I mean, you, the Bafi is not homosexual, but the Bisha is. The active one is not considered homosexual. That's, that's probably cross-culture the most common. The third system is a gay system, where, which we have today, which is probably, it's only very recent. That's when uh, distinguished homosexuals who are distinguished from other, other males have sex with other homosexuals who are distinguished from other males. That's the modern system. What caused that? The first, I just explained this cross-culture court. Internal warfare is related to the mass, the, uh, with all males are expected to have homosexual relationships. <coughs> um, Whereas, in, in the other, these other sides I put up here are <clears throat> they often have the Bisha Buffy system. That's just to compare. I can't, in, the, in the anthropological record, we don't get much in the way of, of gay systems because they're, they're pre industrial societies. They're not found. So, here's studies from Fernando, did studies on homosexual behavior among heterosexual men in favelas in Florinopolis, Istanbul, and Bangkok. And what he found here was, I'm going to go to the second table. What kinds of loyalty are needed other than warfare? And the big thing is, you've got to know the right people. So he had a question on his question. How much do you agree that um, knowing someone, knowing the right person is more important than having a good curriculum? And people who agreed with that statement, that shows that you need, it's a patron-client relationship, you need loyalties to your group. Those people are, those males, heterosexually identified males, um, who had homosexual behaviors were more likely to agree that it's important to know someone. Those heterosexual males who disagreed with that statement were, had no homosexual behaviors. So that's basically the difference between a gay system and a Bisha Buffy system. <coughs> There's some suggestions. My basic suggestion, which I'd love for someone to do to clinch my argument there, is to find out if uh, people with homosexual, male homosexual siblings are less dominating than people with no homosexual siblings. <laughs> that's, I, that's, I think, what sort of clinched the argument, that it's, it's that dominance and submissive behavior in your relatives that's going to make you cooperate more. <clears throat> Um, the fast thing I'm going to do with, I have brought practical time, so it's going to be religion. I think religion is also a question of dominance hierarchies for a reason that, um, I'm going to have to jump stuff. We, we, we construct our abstract concepts based on very concrete ones. I look, this came, this, this was drawn to my attention when I learned German, and the, the, the etymologies were so clear. <laughs> I just gave one example. Abhängen is to depend on. It means to hang on, which I guess you can actually say in English, but I didn't really know that. It's a concrete concept. It's being used for a good abstract, and they come later. And that's how we build up our abstract concepts. Well, our systems of power these days are abstract. I mean, in a simple society, if you have an alpha male, you can, you can see, you can feel, they'll beat you, you, you can smell. <laughs> I mean, it's very concrete. But in our society's power relationships are very abstract. They're far away. So is there any evidence that these power structures are what being represented as what? As your gods. That's what the gods are representing, these power structures. That's our abstract way of deciding um, <clears throat> what, kind of, what our gods are going to be like. And Swanson, I think a very underestimated sociologist, did some wonderful correlations in cross-culture. And he found that 
Just a couple of things. High gods represent central powers in systems with many political levels. That if you have, say, the village and the, and the tribe and then the, a, a larger beard, maybe in Brazil you would have um, Nossa Senhora do Bonfim, Bahia, and then you'd have Parecida, would be a god for representing Brazil, and you would have God, the all-powerful, might be the United Nations. You have these different levels of supernatural beings that correspond to different levels of <clears throat> power in your relationship. With Another correlation to find. Gods represent professions, where professions form political groups. Venus represents prostitute organizations. Mars represents warriors, warrior classes. Ancestor worship. Ancestor worship is what? Do you worship the ancestor who founded your lineage? That's your worship thing. And here's one. Does your God punish morality or doesn't he? And here that's mostly where judges punish your morality or they don't. So our image of God, or of the gods, parallels our images of power relationships within society. And I, th I think that's a very important question. I'd love to see someone carry out more research. I had a student once, why don't you, he was a psychoanalyst, and he thought, like Freud, that gods represented your parents. And I said, well, let's do a little study. Let's see if gods are more like, your relationship with your god is more like your relationship with power in society, or more like your relationship with your parents. Unfortunately, it didn't get very far. I think there was, the sample was not varied enough. It was basically all girl students from a, a female university in <laughs> Kuritsheba, all wealthy, all Catholic, and there just wasn't enough variation to be able to test that very well. So we didn't find anything. <laughs> but I, I would really love to, if someone could do that sometime. Anyway, that's all. And I'm not going to talk about the research suggestions. So they're there if you want something to knock down. And I hope I gave some new ideas to people and <laughs> that um, someone picks up on some of this research, maybe. <laughs> that's all I have to say. Very interesting talk, Dennis. Thank you so much. We have time for a few questions, really quickly. Who has? Hi. <clears throat> so um, I, I got really interested in that part when you said that, that might, there might be there might be a, a correlation between dominance in personality and the taste for pornography. What? the Tabash. Can you hear me better now? Okay, so I was really interested in that part when you were um, saying about a possible correlation between the dominance as a trait of personality and the taste for pornography. And, and it's, it was like a question, like, uh, do people oh, well, with more dominant personalities might oh, prefer this thing. kind of... Okay, there's one thing I, w I didn't mention here. Which I, there's one thing I didn't mention that I would have liked to talk about, and that's that people have found that homophobic men get more turned on to homosexual pornography than non-homophobic heterosexuals. And they, the argument they always give is a Freudian thing, that it's repressed homosexual and all that. Well, Fernando's data was showing there's nothing repressed about these guys who were having sex with the gays. <laughs> so I, I question that. I think what's really happening is that these guys um, I, who were homophobic, I think there are lots of different kinds of homophobia here. I think what happens is they're actually turned on by the homosexual as the dominance. So my suggestion for research is if you run those same experiments, they use a penometer and you see how much your penis gets erect when you watch pornography, I'll bet that these heterosexual males who are looking at homosexual porn, I bet the, the ones who are most, if, if you show them S&M porn, <laughs> where it's very clear who's on top and who's on bottom, I'll bet they get turned on a lot more than by um, sort of lovey-dovey vanilla sex, let's say. <laughs> I see the s &M was exactly where I was, where I was going to. I mean, um, as I study homosexual subcultures, there is one subculture which is specifically um, uh, values the, the domination and submission practices in mm -hmm. the sexual context. So I was wondering if the interest for this kind of um, erotic content, um, pornography whatsoever, could be more related to belonging to a certain group which brings these this characteristics to their, to, their, uh, to their own sexual practices instead of um, only being, uh, I mean, I think it could mean even more 
more than just a personality trait. I think it could be related to, to, to the topic of homosexual subcultures, which also interests a lot to my, to my yeah. own research. Okay, um, I, I, no, I did want to give the book to someone else. I, I'd like to make a distinction between what attracts people in homosexual relationships and homosexual identities, let's say. I think identities are very much a cultural thing. I mean, it's the culture, you may have a certain pattern of what excites you, what turns you on, but you're going to have to adapt to your culture. Remember how, how to live in this you know, Darwinian world? You basically have to adapt. And if your culture has a role where you more or less fit in, that's the role you're going to take on. <laughs> and so I think that these ideas of homosexual culture, they're the roles our society are giving us these days. And you basically try to find a place within the, the, the lecky, the, I don't know how to say that in English, <laughs> in the range of, <laughs> of homosexual behaviors that are offered to you, homosexual identities. And I wrote this book, I wrote a couple of stories. I didn't, one of my arguments, a short way of talking about my argument about homosexuality would be called, blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. And why do the meek inherit the earth? Because they know how to cooperate. <laughs> and I wrote a short story on, called, blessed are the meek. And I, in, and I put the same soul living in three different lives. Once was in Sparta, once was in the medieval monastery, and once was among the Tupinamba. And those, those meek persons have very different lives. There was all the same soul, basically, you know, they're different past lives or whatever. And um, what I was thinking about was that how you, each one had to adopt to the roles that the society provided. And so I think that's something that anthropologists are missing out on. They're, they're concentrating so much on identity that they've forgotten that there's something underlying that, there's something behind that that is pretty, that, that is pretty interesting, I think. And, then, and so I wrote those three stories just to give an example of how these work out. I mean, the Sparta were the Greeks, of course, they had this this apprentice master and apprentice relationship, but they also had submissive males. Greeks had submissive males. In the ancient Athens, for example, um, the submissive males were pretty well tolerated, but they couldn't vote. Of course, the Eronimus and the Elastis relationship, the master apprentice relationship, that was expected of pretty much all males. You know, my father selected a friend or someone he trusted and said, You're going to raise my, I want you to train my son. And that guy became the master, and he had sex with his son, with his son, and taught him lots of different things. And, and it was, of course, an honor for the Erastis, in this case, to have an Aromanus who was succeeded in sports and was good at singing and whatever else. And, but the other guy was, he was your submissive male who was, <laughs> he was there, it was okay, but <laughs> nothing special. But the, 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 the desires, the attractiveness are, are the same. It's what changes is the roles that the society provides for. <laughs> Thank you. <clears throat> Other questions? <clears throat> Very fast. Okay, thank you. Uh, I would like to uh, hear your thoughts on uh, the, 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 this phenomenon that you talked about, uh, demand for conformity in groups and oh, bullying, yes. and the relationship with uh, pathogen prevalence and disease risk infection in different uh, aspects. That was, that was, was one of the ecological threats, yeah. Uh, I was thinking about <laughs> Like uh, when we were more res restricted in our protocols for COVID, uh, there was a lot of group pressure for people to uh, act on them and, and perform this, this protocol. So what do, do, do you hear on that? What are your thoughts? Well, it fits the argument. But <laughs> I, it's one example, perhaps. But I think, I think it's, it's, a lot, it's a fairly large thing. If it works at cross-national level, at cross-state level, at cross-cultural level, there's something there. <laughs> um, I look at Afghanistan. I mean, Afghanistan is super demanding of conformity, and it's also a country beset by warfare and disease and everything else, and you can sort of understand why they're, they're terrified. <laughs> and they're it's afraid to step out of the box. And it's very different from Silicon Valley, where you have to have diversity to create innovation. <laughs> so I think that's a big topic. Where you need innovation, you need diversity. Where you're scared <laughs> of threats, <laughs> then you're, you stay where you're, um, stay within bounds, because you could get killed if you step out of bounds. But they just fit. The, you know. <laughs> the might be related to political. 
<laughs> to political conservative ideas like oh, closing so. boundaries. I, I think so like too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think today in the world, violence has gone uh, recently. It's over over long time. Violence has gone down, but in very recent years, there has been an increase in violence. And Brazil, for example, has a very much a very big increase in violence. And of course, there's there's another thing. I didn't talk about violence here. That I, there's a part on violence I didn't get to. Violence is related to insecure hierarchies, and <clears throat> We have that, and, and, and also related to not having st state control or prisons that don't have control over their prisons. And you get a lot of violence. If there are rules and they're very carefully followed, you don't get so much violence, and people follow the rules. Uh, but you have to have someone over ahead. And, of course, of threats, I think, are related to. You prove of, the of tyranny. I mean, I've heard people say that they'd vote for Bolsonaro because of too much crime. I mean, it's pretty direct. <laughs> Yeah, it's related to that question. Uh, do you think that uh, any differences between uh, conservatism or liberal uh, progressives uh, concerning to uh, threat to perception, uh, perception to th threat to uh, conformity? Do you think that any uh, differences between liberals and pro uh, conservatives in threat to in perception to threat like to conformity? In threats to what? Infirmity? Yeah. Uh, no. To, uh, perception to threat and conformity to. Unconformity. Oh, yeah. I think so. I think I think I think people are people are more afraid of threats to their economic situation, to to violence. And, you know, I think they <laughs> I would guess that, that this fits the, the general argument. <laughs> okay. Thank you so much, Dennis. It was an excellent talk. So we have lunch then and return after it. Okay. Congratulations.